Hey, Tammy, did you ever notice that it's easier to talk about God than it is to talk about Jesus? I have absolutely noticed that, and the big question is, why is that? Yeah, well, stick around, and you're going to want to stick around as well to learn from God's Word why it's so hard to talk to friends and family about Jesus. I'm Woodrow Kroll, and you've joined us here at Back to the Bible. It's a daily radio program that helps you to understand the Bible better and helps you to apply the Bible to your life. Now, I'd like to invite you to join us for the next uh, 25 minutes or so as we take a look at the question, why does the world hate Jesus so much? You can look around and you see that people freely use the name of Christ when they're expressing surprise or pain or anger. But um, if you really try to talk to them about Jesus Christ, a lot of times people, they act like you've crossed over this line, but they don't do that with other religions. So why is that? Yeah, I think any time the truth finds expression, those who hate the truth are going to hate that expression as well. You know, it, it's kind of like saying, I love God, I hate Jesus. Well, if you read the Bible, that's a contradiction of terms. I read a story one time about, actually it was published in um, the Christian Reader magazine. This woman wrote and she said her two grandsons had discovered a new way to express their feelings for each other. When one of them did something wrong against the other one, they would say to each other, I hate you, I hate you. If you have children or grandchildren, you'd know exactly what that's like. And the mother said, I've got to stop this. So she said to these two little boys, that's not the kind of expressions I would expect to hear out of boys who wanted to go to McDonald's for lunch. Now, the older of the two boys was five, and he immediately realized that if he wanted Mickey D's for lunch, he couldn't say, I hate you. So he says to his brother, really, Billy, I don't hate you. And the other brother, with his clear logic of age three, said, well, I hate you because I'm not hungry. <laughs> See, hatred has a way of being an innermost feeling that we don't like to express. And if we aren't comfortable expressing it, we'll find other ways to say it in different words. Hatred is going to come out. Today, we're going to focus on John chapter 7. So you have your Bible there. Turn with me to John chapter 7. I want us to see why does the world hate Jesus so much? Now, you can give your opinion. I can give mine. But if you really want to find out the truth, you go to the source of truth. That's why we go back to the Bible. We want to find out what the Bible has to say about why people hate Jesus so much. Let's start right in verse 1 of chapter 7. John chapter 7, verse 1. After these things... Oh, here we go again. Remember a couple of days ago when we were John chapter 6? He said, after these things. See, John is given to place references and to time references. And if you're a serious student of the Bible, you sit down with a pen and a piece of paper, you can pretty well map out the life of Jesus, where he was, what he did where he was, and when he was there doing what he did where he was, you can pretty well map that out by using the Gospel of John. So after these things, after what things? Well, these events occur somewhere during the period of April to October in the year 29 AD. And they're all summarized. Everything that's happened here is now summarized in verse 1 of chapter 7 where he says, after these things. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee. For he did not want to walk in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. Galilee is the region to the north. Judea is the region to the south. Judea is where Jerusalem is, the capital. Galilee is where the Sea of Galilee is. Most of Jesus' miracles took place in Galilee. Jesus is now kind of hanging out in Galilee because down here in Judea, in Jerusalem, they want to kill him. Now, let me ask you a couple of questions. Is Jesus afraid of these people? Why is he hanging out in Galilee? Doesn't he know he's God? He's better than Clark Kent. Why does he have to fear going to Jerusalem? Well, I think the fact that these people want to kill Jesus is a, just a continuation of a very old theme. If you go back to chapter 5, for example, just back a couple of pages, chapter 5 at verse 14. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See... You have been made well, sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. And the man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who made him well. For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. He healed a man on the Sabbath. Now, there it is in black and white. John is saying the Jews want to kill Jesus. 
And the reason is he healed a man on the Sabbath. Now, you know that isn't the reason at all. That's the excuse they're using. And please don't think this is all the Jewish people of Jerusalem. These are the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem. These are the scribes and Pharisees. These are the people who feel threatened by Jesus' presence in their lives. They want Jesus out. By and large, the rest of the people see Jesus as a person who heals and who feeds and who's an all-around good guy. It's just the Jewish leadership that wants Jesus dead. So what, how far along in his ministry was he here? Was he in the first year when they were threatening to kill him, or is this getting closer to the crucifixion? Or? We're, we're more than halfway through his ministry, well out of the first year now. Lots of people would have seen lots of miracles, heard him teach lots of things at this point, and as a result... Jesus is being persecuted. So the first year comes and goes, basically with the story of Philip here in John chapter 6. We're now into the second year of Jesus' ministry, and these religious leaders are out to get him. So Jesus remains in Galilee. This is the northern region of the country. He believed in the sovereignty of God. I mean, he believed God could keep him from going to the cross at this point. He also knew that he wasn't afraid. He just knew the good sense to understand the program of God. Do what God asks you to do in the time frame in which God asks you to do it. So at this point, Jesus is not willing to go to Jerusalem, be swelled up by these leaders who hate him so much, and taken to the cross. Now, notice in verse 2, it gives us a time frame reference. It says, now the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. That means we're in October... We're in the fall part of the year. This is the very important pilgrim feast, the Feast of Tabernacles. This is when they would build the little huts, you know, and go out and stay in the huts to commemorate uh, not having a place to live as they went through the uh, whole wandering in the wilderness. This is going to be followed hard by the Day of Atonement. So the heart of the Jewish year is coming up. The temple trumpets would play every day at this feast. There's a torch parade that goes through, illuminating finally the great candelabrum of the inner court of the temple. This is big town stuff now. Uh, People are there. They're in a joyous uh, occasion. Everybody's in the streets, the squares, on the roofs. People are dancing of the inner court. Everybody has come to Jerusalem for this occasion. But Jesus opts not to go. And then in verse 3, some people we've not heard from before are introduced into the story. Look at this. His brothers, therefore, said to him, depart from here, go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. And then this great explanation, verse 5, for even his brothers did not believe in him. Now, who are the brothers? They are, you ready for this? His brothers. These are the people mentioned in the Bible as the brothers of the Lord Jesus. They are the sons of Joseph and Mary. And even these brothers never believed Jesus' claims. And they're taunting him here. They're saying, go to Jerusalem. If you're really who you believe you are, you need to go to Jerusalem and prove it. You see, this is what Clark Kent did not have as young Superman. He did not have siblings, half-siblings, taunting him constantly because of the things he could do. Jesus' brothers don't believe he is who he claims to be. So they say, go to Jerusalem and prove it. Jesus isn't going to buy it. Well, this is kind of interesting because you're talking about all these people that are kind of on this pilgrimage. Um, We don't do those now. True. And um, why not? Why do you think that's fallen by the wayside? Well, uh, you don't do it because you're not Jewish. There are lots of Jewish people who still do these things. I have Jewish friends in Jerusalem that when I visit this time of year, they have a little uh, tent set up in their backyard. I was at one Jewish friend's house who was taking his two daughters out at Sukkot, the uh, Feast of uh, Tabernacles here, to uh, show them the tradition of their religion. I asked him specifically, I said, do you do this for religious purposes? He says, no, I do it for historical purposes. He doesn't really believe the Bible. He's an agnostic when it comes to the Bible, but... He does believe in Jewish tradition, and he was doing it for tradition. So there are still people who do this today, but they don't do it in the massive way they did back then because the temple is not in Jerusalem today the way it was in this day. So we could do our own sort of pilgrimage if we have um, something that we want to remember that's really a highlight in our 
Christian faith or just in, in our walk with the Lord? You could. There'd have to be a better reason than just wanting to highlight something. I mean, this pilgrimage was a remembrance of an occasion that was formational in the life of the Israelites. And remember, the Jewish calendar is unique in the fact that every holiday on the Jewish calendar is an event in which God did something for Israel. The Jewish calendar is designed to remind the Jewish people that God has been doing things for them. Would another reason be is because Jesus has died on the cross and they no longer have to do the feasts? Yeah, we as non-Jewish people never had to do the feasts. I mean, that was not a part of our religious nature. But if you today are a Jewish person and you've come in faith the way Abraham did to believe the promises of God and to believe that Jesus is the Messiah the chances are pretty good you aren't going to continue to do this feast. Now, there are Jewish people who do, who are Messianic Jews, who feel that they need to keep their traditions alive. I'm okay with that as long as they don't do it for religious reasons. They do it for traditional reasons. Because for religious reasons, if Jesus nailed everything to the cross, and if Jesus fulfilled all the law, we don't need to be doing the law for the reason he died on the cross. Well, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ today, it may not be a shock to you that people don't like Jesus very much. Oh, sure, they like the Jesus of the movies. They like the Jesus of pictures. They like the Jesus of note cards. They just don't like the Jesus of the cross. They don't like the Jesus who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. They don't like the exclusivity of Jesus. So let's focus here on what the Bible has to say about what's the problem here. Why do people hate Jesus so much? Interestingly enough, Jesus is the one who explains what the problem is. Let's pick it up at verse 6 of John chapter 7. Then Jesus said to them, my time has not yet come. But your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. You go up to this feast. I am not going up to this feast for my time has not fully come. Now, the first verse is more important for our discussion today. But let me start with the second verse. What Jesus is saying to his unbelieving brothers these guys who grew up in the home with him in Nazareth, these people like James and Joseph and the others who were named in Scripture, what Jesus is saying to them is, look, you go up to the feast. It's the thing to do. It's the thing our family has done every year since you've been around our family. I'm not going this year because I know what will happen if I go this year. I will go, but I'll go at the appropriate time. And tucked right in the middle of that explanation to his brothers, why he's not going up to the feast this year, is this expression, the world cannot hate you, but it does hate me. Now, if you want to ask yourself, why does the world hate Jesus? Well, I think a better question would be to ask, first of all, what world is he talking about? I mean, everybody in the world doesn't hate Jesus, do they? You don't hate Jesus, and yet you're a part of the world. The Greek word that is used is the word cosmos. He's talking about the world in general, this world system, this world in which it is Satan's world. Satan is the prince of the power of the air. Satan controls much of the decision making of most of the governments of this world today. We can see it marching toward the book of Revelation on a daily basis. And he's saying it's that world, the world system, that world hates me. And their expression of hate is found in so many, many ways. Today, you can see that system hating the Lord Jesus. For example, those who don't respect human life and those who kill life on a whim are part of the world system that hates Jesus. They're just immoral thugs is all that they are. Those who belittle the teaching of the Bible, whether they're educators or legislators or whoever they are, that's the world system that hates Jesus. Those who not so covertly say that the Christian religion is a hateful religion. That's the system that hates Jesus. And Jesus tells us very clearly why this system hates him. He says, because I testify of it that it works evil. Jesus says to the world system, what you do is wrong. And they say, don't tell me what I'll do is wrong. 
I'll make up my own choice about what's right or what's wrong. Ever heard anybody say that? I mean, that's the world system in which we live. And everyone, every person, every movement, every legislator, every pastor, every Bible teacher, every mom at home or mom in the Senate, every person who takes a belief system that is opposed to what Jesus says in the word of God and adopts that system is a part of a world system that hates Jesus Christ. Now, let me ask you a question. I often say this to people when I go places and I'm doing radio. I said, can I mention uh, back to the Bible? And sometimes they say, oh, sure, we want you to do that. And sometimes they say, well, okay. And my feeling is this, love me, love my dog. You know, where I go, my ministry goes with me. I'm not saying back to the Bible's a dog. Don't misunderstand me. But I'm saying if I go, it goes with me. Wherever you go, Jesus goes with you. And you should not be surprised if a world hates Jesus, if it hates you too. In fact, I'd be surprised and I'd want to investigate what is there in my life that the world doesn't hate. Because if they don't find a lot to hate, they must not find a lot of Jesus in my own life. And I want you to know this. Now, let me be as specific as I can be here. The world has already chosen sides, and most of the world has gone over to Satan's side. A person picks up this book, the Bible, and says, this is who Jesus is, and this is what he wants. Most of the world is going to say, I hate that. And they will say, therefore, I am saying to you, God hates me. God never said he hated sinners. He said he hated their sin. So it's extremely important for us when your neighbor comes to you and they hate Jesus. It's extremely important when your university professor corners you after class and shows his venom toward Jesus. It's extremely important when any person who adopts a lifestyle that's not a biblical lifestyle, such as in the gay and lesbian community, when they come to you and accuse you of hating them, the reason they do that is awfully clear by the words of Jesus. It's clear in the fact that they hate him because he testifies what they do, that it is evil. Bottom line, that's it right there. So if you want to know why the world hates Jesus, look at what Jesus says about the world. And you understand immediately why the world hates Jesus. Now, can we turn that hatred into love? No, but God can and God can use you in your response, your response to wild, wicked, and unsubstantiated claims. God can use your response to show the love of Christ to the lives of those who hate Jesus. And by the way, hate you as a result of hating Jesus. So ask yourself this question. Does your neighbor even know that you're a Christian? I mean, if you're getting along so well in the world, it may be that the world doesn't know your relationship about Christ. Does your neighbor even know that you're a believer? Is there anything in your work habits that would tip off those who work with you or your boss that you're a Christian? The Bible says very, very clearly, don't be surprised, my brothers, if the world hates you. It hated me before it hated you. Paul said, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. The word marks is stigma. There is a stigma to being a Christian. And I fear for the church when we lose the stigma of being the church of Jesus Christ. Because what the world hates, it finds comfortable inside of us and therefore no longer hates us. So how do you approach someone who, as you say, hates Jesus without... And not without turning them off. You know, how do you talk about about Jesus and about what you believe without completely turning them off and so they never come back and want to talk to you again about you it? Always tell them your story. Always tell them your story. You know? Tell them about your life. Tell them what Jesus did in your life. And tell them that you're willing to share more of what he did in your life to them anytime they want to hear more. And every time you have an opportunity to share some of your story, share a little more of your story. And that your story is your story. You have every right to talk about what Jesus did for you. 
And they need to hear what Jesus did for you because they also need to know that what he did for you, he can do for them. The Gospel of John takes us, well, face to face with Jesus. So it's written pretty simply and to the point. Even so, it does contain some deep theology. So to help you get the most out of it, Dr. Kroll put together a Bible study, and it's called John Face to Face with Jesus. The 22 lessons in this study will help you work through the gospel and develop a clear understanding of the life, the ministry, and the love of Jesus. Now, whether you're a seasoned Christian or a brand new believer, you're going to love the way that John face to face with Jesus engages you and makes you think through the passages and apply what Jesus said to your life. Now, hey, it also works well in a group setting. So think ahead for your small group as well as yourself. To order John face to face with Jesus, just call our toll free number. It's 800-759-2425. The number again is 1-800-759-2425. 759-2425. Ask for the Bible study on John. Now to order online, go to backtothebible.org. Again, that's backtothebible.org. Well, Dr. Cole, as we've learned today, it's evident that we are in an anti-Jesus society, a society that really hates that name and the concept. So We're called, though, as Christians, to go out and to boldly proclaim Jesus Christ. So just help us out practically how we do that individually in our world today. Look, people hate Jesus for one of two reasons. Either they don't know what he said, who he is. They've never encountered him in a meaningful way, and they hate him. Or they do know what he said, and they don't like what he said, so they hate him. I don't know of any other options. I think our responsibility is to constantly encounter people with what Jesus had to say about himself. Not necessarily what he had to say about them, but what he had to say about himself. I am come to seek and to save that which is lost. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. There is so much positive you can tell people about Jesus so that when they do encounter him in a meaningful way and they get to the point where they see their sin in relationship to him, they won't hate him. They'll love the fact that he's done something about their sin. Well, tomorrow we're going to jump right back into this chapter because there's still a question that these people ask about Jesus. We haven't answered yet. It's in John chapter 7. And the question is, where did Jesus come from? Where do you get a person like this? What is the origin of Jesus? Where did he come from? They're actually going to ask that question in John chapter 7. We're going to let them answer it as well. That's tomorrow here on Back to the Bible. Thanks for being here today. God bless you. I'm Woodrow Kroll. Have a good and godly day.